See, bud, I love you, man. John chapter 11, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 11, Sage, John 11. You don't have your Bible? Look it up on your phone. John chapter 11. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The reason I mentioned the fact that I, I posted in the beginning was the Word, and in the Word was the beginning, and I love my mom, you know, she, she just doing what moms do, but watch this. Then others started posting about the picture, I should never put a picture of me on it, but that's just trying to grab an attention, but they missed the point. Everybody said they missed the point. There's a point to what I was trying to say, and when we fail to see the point, well, then we fail. And in Luke, excuse me, in John chapter 11 and John chapter 12, there were people who failed to see the point. The last week I preached on a deliberate action. There's times in life you've got to be deliberate. It can't be, a, you, you've got to make that move at that point. Um, so it has to be deliberate. People fail to see the point. Uh, uh, the brother of, of a young girl, in, uh, um, excuse me, of a mother in Louisiana, she, she went into the hospital and did not know that she was having twins. And so she, she had a set of twins. Her husband was offshore working, so her brother took care of naming the kids. And so she, she woke up from her sleep, and she said, what, what did you name the twins? And he said, well, he said, uh, uh, the girl, I named her Denise. And the boy, I named him D-Nephew. <laughs> you get that later. Last week was tremendous memorial. You can't have a memorial without sacrifice. You can't have sacrifice without love. Love is the root of a good memorial, of remembering. I have memorials that pop up. I was talking to my pastor on the way here, who, by the way, is planning on being here in October for our conference. But I was talking with him, and I said, Pastor Mike, uh, people that I've loved keep popping up on my Facebook post, Instagram stuff, and I, I miss them. I miss people, you know, and I've loved them through a long time. I was with a nurse this week. I went in and had an injection in my knee, and she was telling me that her pastor died from COVID pneumonia. And I'm, I'm someone that's uh, a little skeptical about all the things that I've seen over this pandemic, as you know. And uh, I know many of you have the same feeling. But I found myself tearing up for her and hurting for her because I could see how much she loved her pastor, and uh, there was nothing she could do to change that. And then this morning, I kicked on sports for a minute, and I watched a guy play a golf tournament, H, Memorial Golf Tournament. He's six strokes ahead, gets to the 18th hole, six strokes ahead, going to play today, would probably win the championship. And they told him at, on the 18th hole that he had COVID. Hold on. No symptoms playing marvelous golf, but you got COVID, you got to set out tomorrow on Sunday and not win the tournament. And I think to myself, the most least contact sport in America is golf. You can quarantine him for 18 holes, walk beside him or whatever, throw him, throw him a ball, amen, but no, we got our rules. And so I, I'm conflicted. How many feel conflicted? How many feel like they moved the goalpost? How many feel like they turned it sideways and you can't even kick nothing through it? It's just, it's just a, a weird time of life. So get back to the Word of God. I just wanted to say a few things before I said a few things. We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. You know, I, when people have, last week I had people from Oklahoma City show up uh, at the, the memorial service, and they, they knew me from, from times I've been and preached up in Oklahoma City, and they came in, and uh, I showed them around the property. They said, well, what's that cross for? And I said, it's a memorial for a man whose wife had died. Well, what's that bench for? I said, well, that's a memorial for a man who worked on this property whose uh, wife still goes to this church, and those are memorials. You know, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Albert Einstein said the value of a man resides in what he gives and not in what he receives. The greatest men and women of history 
history, and I put this down because I wanted you to catch it. The greatest men and women of history, those that will be remembered for generations, made their mark on this earth through the gener generosity of spirit, their willingness to sacrifice themselves for the betterment of their society, the people around them, and those in need. This week I had a camp come out. All these gospel kids are there, you know, and I got 50 of them in front of me, and we fix to go off the tower. And I look at them, and I say to them, and if you don't know about the tower, it's 40 foot high, 300 foot zip line, and we're going to throw them off, me and David will. And so I get them set up out there, and I look at them, and I said, hey, guys, let me just ask you a quick question. There were 12 spies that went into the promised land, 12. 12 men that went over there, and they saw giants. And they came back with, um, what it was it, the two things they came back with? Oh, I remember. Uh, it was um, saccharin and almond milk. Pastor, what are you saying? They came back with milk and honey. But if it's today's generation, it would have been saccharin and almond milk. I look at my refrigerator. I got soy milk, soy milk light, almond milk. Uh, I, got, I had six different types of milk in my fridge. I drink milk. But the other three people in my house drink six different other styles because they're intolerant to so many things. It's hilarious. But anyway, they come back and they got they come back and they got milk and honey. And they talk about the great land. But then twelve there's twelve spies. But two of them, I'll tell you, two of them real fast: Joshua and Caleb. And I told the kids that I'll give you two of them: Joshua and Caleb. Name me any of the other ten. And nobody could name me the other ten, Charlie, that went over into the promised land. The reason why is is we do not build monuments to people who choose to fail. And when you choose to fail and you choose not to take risk and you choose not to go in and take your promise, amen, people don't remember you. And when you're not a giver, you're not, not somebody that believes in legacy, they don't remember you. So we don't remember the other ten. They're listed in the Bible, but we remember Joshua. Amen. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We remember Caleb, give me my mountain. We remember these guys. And they were, they were generous to a fault because they wanted to win something. They wanted to gain something here. Generosity is characterized by a noble spirit, liberal in giving, marked by abundant proportions. Where the presence of God is... There is always a spirit of generosity. And this is why Mary and Martha, you got to love Mary and Martha, M&M. &M. Amen. These two girls, they, they were amazing because they opened up their home over and over to Jesus and to the disciples to love on them, to care for them. And because of that, I believe that Jesus responded to them. Now, it looked like he was a little bit late in John chapter 11. Are you comfortable? John chapter 11, verse 32 says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him. I know what you think. Pastor, you're moving so fast I can't stand up quick enough. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now remember, Lazarus is dying. He's a matter of fact, he's, Jesus got the report that he's going to die. He's a, uh, a great friend, and he delays his showing up. Delays are not necessarily denials. Just because you had a delay in your life of a promise you believed for, it doesn't believe that God denied you. Follow me? Okay, so at this point, they get, he gets there, and Lazarus is dead. As a matter of fact, how long has he been dead? Three days. Okay. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He said, where would you lay him? They asked, come and see, Lord. They replied, Jesus wept. Shortest prayer in the Bible. Jesus wept. Now, I looked the word up, wept there, and it's not the weeping of, of just sobbing. It's almost anger. It's almost like snorting. It's almost like, how, how could you think that, that at this moment I can't do something about this situation? And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Don't you love people like that? Don't you love the self-righteous, the pharisaical attitude that would say, you know what? He, he had done this. Why couldn't he have done that? This hit me. Religion always questions motives. Religions always question motives. When I'm reading through this passage in John 11 and John 12, there are motives all through here. You've got Judas questioning motives. You've got the religion questioning motives. Amen. They justify their self-righteousness, but they fail to see the point. Everybody say they failed to see the point. Say it again. They failed to see the point. They didn't see it. Here's a deliberate action. Jesus is waiting for the right moment to raise Lazarus. John eleven forty one. 41. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. I know that. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may also believe that you 
sent me. Remember, Jesus never talked about being born. He always talked about being sent. Amen. You sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes, let him go. Father, I thank you for the word of God. Lord, take off our grave clothes today. Release us into a world that needs to know your resurrected power. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, give me a big amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. I, I don't know. Can you imagine with me? Can you imagine with me being dead for three days? Wrapped up in linen, your face is wrapped up. Once dead, now alive. The power of God surging through you. He releases you from your old ties and lies to live in peace and power. God opened your grave of failure to prove that he wants you to have an abundant life. Amen. He didn't do this, I'll be honest, for Lazarus' sake. He did it for Mary. He did it for Martha. Amen. How would you live if you'd been snatched from grave's icy grip? How would you live if you tasted death? But heaven's lips resuscitated you. I think of Pat when I was over here with Cindy a while ago. You know, twice now God has raised this man from the dead. Twice now that he should have passed. And yet he, here he is. And there's such an appreciation. Let me say this. There's not only appreciation for the one that being rose or raised from the dead. There's also an appreciation for those who loved him. Amen. So Mary and Martha loved Jesus for the fact that he brought their brother back to life. We too have been abandoned in a coffin of chaos, our lives beginning to stink, till we heard our sweet Savior say our name and resurrect our dead bodies. And that's what he did. He pulled us out of the grave. And by the way, the scripture does say that Lazarus by now is starting to have a little odor to him. Amen. He's smelling just a little bit. I found out this, and this is very important for you to catch. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And as you move through life after your death, you begin to learn how to become more like him. But, he, but I've heard this over and over. Well, they not, they, some of the people in that church ain't good. <laughs> I know that. I'm, a, I'm absolutely aware of that. Amen. I haven't always been good. Don't be nice to me. Thank you. You know what, H? I haven't always been good. But I can tell you this. I was dead. And he brought me back alive. Yes, Amen. He resurrected me. And he's resurrected visions and dreams in my life. And he won't let me just stay down. There's something about it. It's a deliberate action. Amen. Jesus waited. He waited for the right time. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out. Now, what are you going to do after Jesus' resurrection? This is what's important. I got born again in 1979 in November. Uh, and I remember after that, God did such a job in my life that I just wanted to be in church. I, and, and here's what I discovered. First, church is about family. Second, it's about community. Amen. Learning to have community, to connect with one another. And, and some churches, folk will come to church and never connect. You never connect with people. You just come in, you walk away, and you wonder why I don't have any friends. You don't have any friends because you haven't been friendly. You got to, if you're going to be, you've got to connect with people. You got to talk to them. You got to put your hand out. You got to come up with a reason for, amen, making those connections. Because I believe, and you, you can say, Pastor, you're crazy. I believe when we get to heaven, it's well, who we know here that we're going to know there. Now, will it mean we'll make friends there? I hope so. I want to get to know Moses and David. I want to talk to Barabbas. I want to, I want to know about certain disciples, and what, what went on in their life. I want to connect there. I pray that. But I do know this. I can make friends here. I want to have more friends, and I want to see community, and that's what I love about our church, because people start to connect and get together, and it's not about I'm coming here to make a business proposition. I want to know who my brother is. I want to know who my sister is. Amen. I want to make the, and that's, and that's a powerful thing, and when that happens, you'll stick, but you won't stick in a church until you get, <clears throat> make friends, and then you start producing, and when you produce in life, it brings fulfillment. Yesterday, I produced. Oh, I, I, and I didn't like it, but I was asked to go mow a yard. Now, it's my yard, but all I got, it's, it's, a, it's a rent house that we, we purchased. It, it needed mowing. My wife said, you go mow it with a push mower. Do you know how many years it's been since I mowed a yard with a push mower? 35, 40 years. I, I, ride, I ride nice mowers, man, when I'm mowing David, I pert near died. Amen. Twice I had to stop, get water, 
I'm pouring sweat. I don't sweat. I mean, I just want these guys just a little on my face. But I had sweat pouring down to here. I'm, over, I'm thinking, I'm 60-year-old arthritic man, and I'm pushing a mower out here, and I've got kids in my life that should be doing this. But when I finished, I sat there and said to myself, look what you just did. Production equals fulfillment. I felt so fulfilled. I got back to the house. Lori asked me, why are you sweating? I just mowed the grass. Oh, you're so sweet. No, I'm so tired. Amen. It was a deliberate action. Amen. So here's Jesus waiting on the right moment. He brings Lazarus out of the grave. Now, what's Lazarus going to do? He's going to hang out with Jesus. And that's what you do. Whenever you get resurrected, you hang out with Jesus. Whenever I get medicine, you know what that medicine will say? Take till empty. He will. And yet you'll look up in medicine cabinets, Keith, and there'll be a whole bottle of stuff that nobody took. They just took it till it felt better. And then they quit taking it. But it didn't say that. It says, take till empty. When you take the gospel, when you take the gospel, you take it till it's empty. And it ain't empty till you're gone. You got to keep taking this thing. You can't back away from it. So here in John chapter 12, we read six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus so recently raised from the dead was living. Lazarus and his sisters, hey, they get an invitation to Jesus to dinner at their home. Whose servant is Martha? Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard of expensive perfume, poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, even then getting ready to betray him, said, Why wasn't this oil sold and the money given to the poor? It would have easily brought 300 silver pieces. Now, let me back off just a second here. Now, I didn't bring my big bottle of perfume. Uh oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, actually, I brought a big bottle of Old Spice on the. That old, I just started spraying it Old Spice. It'd go around the room. You smell like my daddy. Every woman in the house here would. But here's the thing. A pint is a lot, and it used the term oil. Again, I was talking to my pastor this morning. He talked about some Japanese sailors who found a whale and began to tow it into the harbor. On its way there, they realized the whale was full of vomit. And they took the whale vomit and realized by processing that it would make the perfume that women wear last longer. Some of you ladies don't even know that you dabbing on whale vomit every time you. But it was worth, Miss Terry, $2 million. $2 million worth of whale vomit. I mean, it, they, they, it's something that they seek after now to make that perfume last a long time. You can Google it. I, I didn't. I don't know. I just heard Pastor Mike say it, but it, it made sense to me. Yeah, it sounded good. <laughs> Amen. So here she is with a whole pint of of alabaster, if you would, perfume, and she poured it on his feet. She wiped his feet with her hair, and Judas gets a little upset about it. And he said, why wasn't the oil sold and the money given to the poor? It would have easily brought 300 pieces of silver. He said this not because he cared two cents about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Jesus said, let her alone. She's anticipating and honoring the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. The reason I wanted to, to restate this today is I, I fell short in loving Jesus the way the Scripture does. Many times we will compare ourselves with other Baptists or Catholic or Pentecostal or, or other family members, our relationship with Jesus. But the bottom line is I can compare myself with somebody who's not doing so good and feel good about myself. But when I compare myself to this, I fall so short. And here's a woman whose brother has been raised from the dead. And she has such an appreciation. And Judas missed the point. The disciples missed the point. The religious people missed the point that the reason Jesus waited three days is so that they could see the glory of God. They missed the point here. Amen. So we got Mary who is a worshiper. We got a box that's being broken. Amen. The anointing was sacrificial. It was worth a year's wages. You, you, I, I know this. Very few of us have ever taken a year's wages and poured it into the things of God and given it over to him. And I will tell you one this important. You're not going to do this every Sunday. But one time in your life, I pray that you'll break a vase.
At least one time in your life, I pray you'll do something extraordinary. That you'll do something just right out. You know what? And maybe you'll do it two or three times in your lifetime. You can't do it every week. But every now and then, I can do just something extravagant for God. Amen. I can just say, God, here's, here's what I just want to devote to you. The anointing was a commitment beyond common sense here. A bottle of perfume worth the whole year's wage being broke, poured out upon the head. Common sense would say to a genuine believer, sell it. Use the money for the poor, the hungry. Amen. The homeless. This is just what the disciples did in fact they were indignant and vexed about it truthfully they were preaching Jesus words back I hate when people preach my stuff back to me I hate it every now and then I'll, I'll do something and they go well you remember pastor you preached about forgiveness and look how you're acting right now yeah that's why I'm careful about what I post I, I just say you know I just ain't gonna say nothing about it just because because people will throw it back and here's who wants to really do it relatives Amen. They'll, they'll, they'll see you do something. They'll throw it right back in your face. Amen. So here's Jesus preaching about reaching the poor, being a blessing to the poor, doing this for the poor. Amen. Laying hands on the poor, healing the blind. Amen. Helping the lepers who were poor, all that. And then here comes this bottle of ointment coming out and spilt upon him. And Judas backs away. Listen, you can't get it back in the bottle anyway. Why say something? Why you want to say something now? She's already poured it out. Why, you can't put it back in the bottle. The bottle broke. Amen. She didn't drip it. Amen. She dumped it on him. Hallelujah. So you can't get the perfume back in the bottle. You ever broke a bottle of perfume, sir? <laughs> you can't get it back in the bottle. So here's a situation where Judas might as well just shut up because you can't change the situation here. So, but he goes off and he says, hey. That could have been used for the poor. So now you're touching Jesus. You're trying to touch his buttons. You know people that like to touch your buttons? You know the best way to stop people from touching your buttons? Hide them. Hide your buttons. Don't show them your buttons all the time. Some people just said buttons. It's like the bozo, man. It's like a red knot right on the end of their nose. H. So here, let me walk you through some things here. They failed to see the point. First, Mary was driven to express her faith in her Lord and her love for him personally. It was the most meaningful thing she could do. She thought to herself, "My, it's literally a dowry. It's what she had saved up. It was something that was going to help her through marriage or through life. Amen. She could, she could use just a little bit of it. She didn't have to use the most, but the most significant person in her life was there now. Amen. He raised her brother from the dead. She has an appreciation. Amen. The, the sacrifice. True love sacrifices self. It's a commitment here. Amen. It gives of itself. It is when we sacrifice, dig deep into our lives, and our finances and give of ourselves all we are and have that we really show love the more we sacrifice, the more we demonstrate our love. Some are willing to give what they do not have. Judas called it waste. He said, this is wasteful. Jesus called it worship. Some of you come in here that's on, on church or whenever time, you see, you know, that's kind of waste to stand up here. Raise a hallelujah. You call that waste you want to. He calls it worship. Amen. It does. Listen, listen to me. It also gives honor. And when you honor, you give value. If I, when I say yes, sir, no, sir, a guy said to me the other day, he said, you don't have to call me, sir. I said, yes, I do. Because I honor you. You're older than me. I appreciate you. I appreciate your service. Amen. You're a Vietnam vet. I honor you. Amen. When I honor, I don't have to say it, but I'm giving value to that which I honor. Amen. That's what, that is what is lost in this generation. And I don't mean to pick on this generation because there's some really great kids coming up. I know that. But the bottom line is, is to learn how to give honor. That's why last week was so important. It was saying we value those who served in the military for us. Amen. She gave her legacy, a destiny. From then on, she'll always be remembered. Givers always leave a legacy. Something behind. They want to remind people they mattered. I want you to know I, I mattered. Amen. It was important for me to be here. Second, what the disciples failed to see was there was a certain extravagance in love. The alabaster jar perfume was meant to be used again, drop by drop. It was meant to last for years, perhaps even for a lifetime. But in a moment of utter devotion, I don't, was it spontaneous? Was it something she planned? I don't think she planned it. I think she, she was in a moment. She saw it. And the, when those moments come, they're so important. At that moment, she just spontaneously went back and got it. She walked out. She did something women weren't allowed to do. Two things. First, you're not allowed to eat with the men. Second, you ain't allowed to let your hair down in front of the men. 
And she pulled the pen out. Her hair falls down. She breaks the box. I, was she struggling or what? Was it, was it intentional? But she broke it and she poured it over him. You know, love does not stop nicely to calculate the less or the more. Love does not stop to work out how little it can respectively give with a kind of divine extravagant love gives it has. It never counts the cost. Calculation is never a part of it. I'm just going to break this and see where it is. And it flowed over him. Amen. It affected him. Here's something else. The Disciples failed to say that love knows well, knows well that there are certain moments in life which will come and they never return again. They come and never return again. I was preaching for Bishop Miller, Tony Miller. Many of you remember Bishop. He passed away a month or two ago. And David, I, I don't think you were there then, but I don't think you were with us. I can't remember. But I walked into church and I thought to myself, you know what this man needs? He needs a nine millimeter. And I brought, was you there? Okay, so it, this is kind of weird because we've hit a real place, a weird place in life when it comes to guns and stuff, but I didn't think nothing of it. So I brought him a Beretta to church and gave it to him behind the pulpit. And he's standing there with a gun in church. <laughs> you know, and he's a little awkward anyway when it comes to stuff like that. And I'd, I'd question, oh, yeah, I still got it. You know, I got to, but, but it was a moment I had, and I thought, you know what? And every now and then I'll have a gun, and I'll say to myself, you know, I don't need this gun. I wonder who needs this gun. Amen. You know, Ken, you know how it works. Amen. You just, you just give the gun up because you don't need it. Uh, it. Just something happens. But it's one of those, it's in, it's in that moment. Now, listen to me. There are moments in life that will not return. I believe opportunity knocks all the time. But there are certain times in life where if I don't move at this moment, I will miss this window. And if I miss this window, I'll miss this blessing. Amen. And so she did something. There are endless and limitless opportunities for you to help the poor. Jesus said, the poor you got with you always. There's two things we're never getting rid of. Mosquitoes and the poor. They're always going to be there. And I'm not putting you down. I've lived as poor. Amen. I understand poor. You know, I had an outhouse when I was a kid. I picked cotton as a kid. I ate beans a lot when I was a kid. Never knew I was poor. Dad never told us. Amen. We didn't go around acting poor. It just you wore them jeans until you wore holes in them. You put patches in them. That's why I'm blown away with all these new jeans that people wear. You're paying money for holes in your jeans. We wore holes into our jeans. Amen. Our jeans had legit holes. And then you wore them and you patched them. And then when you couldn't patch them no more, you cut them off and you wore them as shorts. Yeah. I remember running out in a rainstorm, my mom throwing us a bar of soap and saying, get a shower. <laughs> listen, listen, that's, that's, that, and I know some of you think, that's crazy. No, no that, thank God. I thank God for that. I look back on it, I wear it like a badge of honor. Amen. Now, do I want my kids to go through that? No. Do I want to have to go through it again? No. Do I want to have to mow another yard with a push mower? No. But I look back on it and say, I thank God where I came from. Amen to the things that happened there. So I say it again. The, the, the poor you're always going to have with you. If Mary had not seized that moment to make known her love for Jesus, the opportunity would have never come again. There are times, and watch this, in this church, that you'll feel a need to come to an altar. You wouldn't feel a need to lift your hands. You might even feel a need to take off running around the building. Amen. I don't care. But when, that need, when it hits, don't sit there and say, well, it'll happen again next Sunday. It won't. It won't. When you, feel, when, when you have the urge to give, to be a blessing, to do something for somebody, amen, do something for the house of God, for the people of God, when you, when you sense that moment, don't let it pass you by. Don't let, I mentioned, uh, I looked down and saw j I, I, Years ago, I bought a vehicle, uh, and, and I felt bad. I didn't feel bad. I just knew when I bought it, there was somebody going to say something about it. I drove old vehicles, H. When I, when I first started pastoring the church, I bought a brand new blue Dodge Dakota. And I got it with a five-speed shift in it so people wouldn't think I was all that by getting an automatic. You realize, you realize that, that kind of thinking I had because I was so uh, put down because people thought you, you, you're all about the money? You don't even realize at that time I was pastoring a church that was bringing in over $2 million a year? And I was struggling with the fact that having an automatic would make people look that would, would make people think I was all that. I had to break that cycle and get to a place where I realized I don't care what y'all think. Oh, but somebody still, still said something about it. And I remember I was walking through the church and J Bo looked at me and I had a Mazda. 
when it beat 2,500. He said, hey, man, what you going to do with that monster? As soon as he said it, I threw the keys in the air and kept right on walking. He grabbed the keys. He drove that monster to Exxon for years. I didn't need the truck no more. I could have sold it, but it was a moment. It was just a moment. Amen. To, to, to do something. And it's not boasting on myself. I'm just telling you, this is how I've lived. And this is how I've done. Jesus defended her devotion. Amen. On purity of motive, not self-seeking. Amen. He said, she did this for my burial. You know, you not heads. I've been saying it for years that I'm, they're going to tear this temple down and I'm going to raise it up. They're going to tear it down in three days. I'll raise it up. Y'all ain't caught it. She caught it. She understands I'm going to die. She knows to give me my flowers now. Don't wait till I'm dead to come in here with a green pot, amen, to make me feel good about it. I'm already gone. But if you want to be a blessing to me, give me my flowers now. And she poured that all over him. And, and I can't prove this, but it's within a week he's going to be on the cross. And that perfume, you know as I do, once you get it on you, it sticks. Listen, this is just a little bit of oil. I can pour this on you. You'll smell this for the rest of the week. And when they beat the body of Jesus and then whips went into his flesh, that's the smell of that ointment from the week before of her devotion had to keep uh, lingering in the air. Every time they hit him, you could smell, amen, the, the smell of the alabaster. Amen, because of the love she had. Come on up, Joseph. Amen. Mm, thank you, Jesus. There are moments in life you cannot let go by. There are carpe diems. They're the seeds, the moments. What else did they fail to see? Fourth, love puts into the world a fragrance which cannot be removed. When you worship, when you're broken, when, when, and I will walk away from this just a minute because I got to talk to y'all. I think to myself, it's a couple of things here. First off, Lazarus stunk. Okay, we understand that. He smelt when they got there. The reason he smelt is he didn't have enough ointment on him. He didn't have enough embalming stuff on him. Who has the embalming stuff? His sister Mary. Mary didn't put it on him. She just probably sprinkled him a little bit, thinking that'd be all right. But now he stinks. He comes out of the grave, and she has a moment here to do something in that living room. And she brings out, now, Lazarus could have been upset. He could have said, wow, you, everybody talking about me resurrected, and all they say is, yeah, he resurrected, but he stinks. And you coming out with this big old bottle of, of perfume you could have used on me. And she's looking at him, I know, bro. I know I could have used it on you. And I do love you, but you can't get me to heaven. And she breaks it over Jesus. And at that moment, he defends her. and says, she did this for my burial. Judas gets all upset. He's all mad about the moment. But here's the thing you can't stop. The fragrance fills the room. You can't get it back in the bottle. There's something about brokenness. There's something about just loving God. I think I put a quote. Mike, come on. Go to the next one. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. She gave up what she could not keep. When I go to my grave, there are things I cannot keep. I've got to start releasing things and have been for years, releasing things in the lives of people, just letting it go. You cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Listen. I, I cannot lose out with Jesus. I can't lose out. Jim Elliott, and I didn't look up his age, but he was probably in his 30s. He was a missionary to the Quicha Indians in Ecuador. Look this up. He would fly down. He would witness to them. He'd drop pamphlets. He'd land on the shores of the river. He would put uh, the natives in his plane, he would fly them around. He was making headway. He was winning them. Him and four other missionaries went down. They landed on the, and they met 10 natives they had never seen before. And the natives speared them, killed all five of them, put them in the river, and they found their bodies down the river. A book was written called Through the Gates of Splendor. 
about a man who sacrificed his life and his four friends. The wives of those men with such devotion worked for Wycliffe Bible Translators, which means they could translate a Bible into the Keton Ecuador Indians. Many of you know that we've been supporting missionaries in Ecuador, the Renales, for 20 years. Amen. That's where they're at. So here, they went back to that little place in Ecuador, and they won those natives to Jesus. The wives did. I think to myself, how, how would you, sis, go and win those back to Jesus who just killed your husband? And yet they did. Jesus said, I think I got another scripture here somewhere. There it is. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. Jim Elliott also said another quote. This was it. When it comes time to die, make sure all you got to do is die. When it comes time to die, make sure all you got to do is die. Stand with me. When I see the lives of men and women who give and give up, when I see one like Mary, I'm very well versed in the fact that when it comes to churches, particularly in America, 20% of the people in the church give 80% of the giving. I know that. See, our, our commitment is not as heavy as we, we act like. We think we showed up when well, that was committed. If we responded online, that was committed. 30% of members give the other 20%, which says that 50% of members give nothing. That's just church life. That's not the way it is here. There are more givers here than these stats that I can read. John Wesley said, get all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Most folk I know say, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. Yeah, just hang on to it. Just keep putting it in storage. Martin Luther said, I've tried to keep things in my hands and lost them all, but what I've given to God, I still possess. We often fail to see the point that what we sow, we will reap. And when we sacrifice and we love, and, and listen to me, I kept reading. I didn't stop. I thought, yeah, I mean, you're going to read some more here. So I read about Laz Lazarus is there, Mary, Martha, Jesus, disciples, John chapter 12, verse 9. Then a large crowd of Jews realized that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 10. So the high priest planned on killing Lazarus too. You see that? The high priest planned on killing. He's already died once. And you want to kill him again? You know the problem with trying to kill somebody that's already been dead and resurrected? You can't threaten a dead man. You can't threaten him. I've done been there. Amen. Since he was the reason why so many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. You need to understand your spiritual life is this. That God raised you from the dead. Your old man has died. Your new one has come to life. You are resurrected from the grave. He called your name. Pulled you out of the grave. Amen. He pulled you from a place of darkness into a place of light. Amen. He made you an ambassador of heaven. So you can represent him on this earth. One day you're going to go back to the kingdom of God. Amen. People are threatened by you. Because you've been resurrected. Satan hates you because you've been resurrected. Lazarus was added to the hit list. You can't threaten a dead man. People only fear what they haven't faced. Lazarus knew the cold terror of lying with other rotting corpses. He'd already faced death. He wasn't intimidated. Let me say this one statement again. You, people only fear what they haven't faced. We faced a pandemic. I don't live in fear. I jumped out of an airplane. I no longer fear jumping out of a plane. Written Harley's through my, I don't fear. 
whatever you that but here's the thing that grab, grabs us all most of us have not faced death yet and the scripture tells us over and over to understand that Christ has defeated death that we no longer have to have the tyranny of it heads bowed eyes closed At this moment, we remind ourselves that like Lazarus, we've been resurrected. We are to serve like Martha and be grateful to worship and give as Mary. And there will always lurk within us an ungrateful Judas that we've got to deal with. Father, I thank you for this house and for your people. Raise us from the dead. Call us forth from our tombs of disappointment discouragement indebtedness let us like Mary be appreciative of ministry and Jesus and the things that he did let us break a vase someday that will express how much we really love you let us build community within this house Amen. If you need a prayer right now, you've been maybe away from God or you just need healing in your body, I think God knows. Put your hand up. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every hand that's lifted. I speak salvation into their life and that you forgive us of our sins. Wash over us. Healing into their bodies. Bring healing into their lungs. Lord, we're nothing but plumbing and electricity. God, let the electric flow, let the plumbing work. God, I thank you for touching our bodies. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. <laughs> amen, amen. I had an old guy tell me, he said, you ain't nothing but plumbing and electricity, boy. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize, yeah, he's right. <laughs> Got to keep all of it working, amen. You may be seated. Our servant leaders are coming up. Boomer, Kathy, thanks for coming today. Good to have you all here. Amen, Miss Betty. Thank you, Kay. Thanks for coming. Amen. If you, uh, your tithe and offering envelopes are in the, the pews in front of you, man, be wise today. Be a giver. Honor God. Again, honor shows value. So much you value him. Amen. I've mentioned this that.